Hello and welcome to NPTEL's course on communication skills. Now we are on module number 3 and lecture number 3 on nonverbal communication. This is the third lecture on nonverbal communication and this time we are going to focus particularly on body language and proxemics. I will tell you what uh, uh, these terms mean just in a few minutes. Uh, overall, in the past two lectures and in the lecture that is continuing now and the lectures which are going to come, overall in this module, what are you going to learn about? You will learn about nonverbal communication, its definition, its use and how you can use this to your benefit. You will also try to understand body language and the importance of it. You will try to understand the functions of nonverbal communication, types of nonverbal communication and applying this nonverbal communication especially in a professional context to gain a professional image. Now, these are the general objectives in which we are going to deal with this. Now, just to begin this lecture, let us go back to the origin of nonverbal behavior, nonverbal communication, how this study actually started. You will be interested to know that the beginnings of nonverbal communication actually started with ornithologists and biologists. Those people who are studying about birds and animals are the pioneers in trying to identify, trying to codify, trying to even understand the codes in terms of nonverbal communication. Biologists were first investigating body language in association to watching birds, in association to peculiarly noting their behavior and this later followed by people who were interested in animals also such as Charles Darwin who wrote the famous the expression of the emotions in man and animals in 1872. Now, this book in fact is a very pioneering study on body language although he was not talking about particularly man, he started with animals and then started linking animal behavior with human behavior and then trying to find some universals. Now, this was followed by others like Eibel, Eibel Felt who wrote Love and Hate Natural History of Behavior Patterns. They started understanding behavior in terms of patterning, in terms of certain universal givens and then followed by Despond Morris and the famous book The Naked Ape. All actually deal with animals, their behavior and then they try to correlate the behavior with mankind, human beings. Now, it leads us to the debate when they are saying that okay, it is of course, with uh, animals. There are certain behaviors and those behavior we can also see in human beings. We enter into a debate as whether this nonverbal communication, nonverbal behavior as such is something that is natural or something that can be nurtured, which means is it something that is given to us by God, something that is innate or something that can be trained, cultivated as a civilized behavior. Now, first let us look at the debate that says that it is nature. Now, the debate that says that it is nature or the people who think that it is something that is given, they think that it is in the genetic coding, okay. it is in the DNA itself they say, the way a person behaves in a particular situation, especially in a particular communicative situation. They say that the behavior shown by the human being is actually coded in the genetic makeup of the person. Now, these people argue that it is heredity, it is inherited from uh, forefathers, it is inherited from parents, grandparents and then they say that it is innate, it is within. So, no external thing can come and change it. So, that is their argument. Now, accordingly you have books published, you have a lot of illustrations to demonstrate this fact. We have the pioneering work uh, done by Charles Darwin which I discussed just before and then the series that followed. Darwin's uh, theories were propounded further by people like uh, Despond Morris. So, they all concur with the view that it is genetics, it is nature 
along with Ekman and Friesen. So, these are pioneering people who think that it is natural, it is in the DNA, it is in genetics and it has nothing to do with uh, training somebody and changing it because it is inherited, it is coming from the forefathers. Now, this is one thinking and when, he, when we go by this thinking, there are some supporting evidences to go by uh, this thinking because certain things, certain emotions, certain way those emotions are being expressed by human beings are of course universal. Look at the fact for example, things like narrowing of the eyes is universal and natural, narrowing as against opening it widely. Now, in the Japanese comic, the famous manga, the heroes are wide eyed. So, wide eyed and innocent. So, when somebody is wide eyed, open eyes indicates innocence, honesty, directness, straightforwardness, as against narrow eyed, where the person is considered to be villain, criminal, conniving manipulating, wily, wicked and so on. When the eyes are narrow, they are literally and figuratively covering something, some kind of secret or covering some innermost thoughts. When the eyes are wide open, they are just making that my heart is open, I am like an open book. Now, even in the Japanese comic, the heroes are wide eyed and indicating that they are innocent and the bad guys, the villains are always shown with narrow dice. Now, this feature of indicating innocence using wide eyes and indicating wickedness or cunningness by using or showing narrowed eyes is something that is felt as a universal thing. Now, this goes again with our uh, uh, genetics debate that yeah, yes of course, when this is universal this is also a universal behavioral pattern and then even when you look at animals, when they are quite excited, their eyes are quite open and then when they shy away from certain situation or when they want to avoid certain contact, so they try to narrow their eyes. So, this proves the genetics debate that it is something that is inherent and something that is universal. This also could be seen in terms of the way we use territory. Although I will talk more about territory, use of space very soon, but just to use this as a kind of supporting evidence to the debate that it is of course nature that is giving the nonverbal behavior in human beings. Look at the notion of the use of territory, the use of one's space. If you look at the way animals use territory, we find lot of correlation with the way human beings use territory. Literally the way animals use nest okay, as their home and for man nest is again figuratively its home, its private space where intimate relationships are formed and developed. Now, on the other hand, both human beings as well as animals do not entertain strangers to encroach upon their private territories, be it nest or home. In case of animals, they may be frightened if they are weak or they may become aggressive if they are strong and same thing goes with a man. Somebody knocking at a door when a very personal a uh, private discussion is going on at home, the man decides whether to open the door or just not to do that or even when he opens it is very curt and let us say there is a seller outside wants to sell something, he does not even talk to him courteously, he just tells him he does not want and shuts the door. Aggressive that I cannot allow you to enter into my territory. Now, this notion of using territory is again supporting this argument that it is of course given by nature, 
the behavior, the non-verbal behavior is of course given by nature and we also safeguard our private space just like the way birds and animals safeguard their private space. Even if it is a bird, okay, when you try to steal the egg from the bird or when you go and touch the small ones, it will become ferocious, it would not let you touch the uh, small ones. Now, when that is the case, when we see a similar kind of behavior in human beings, we go with this theory that of course, it is genetic, it is hereditary and it is universal and it is something that is natural. Now, this is well defined, but on the other hand, there are also people who behave, who believe that behavior is something that is cultivated, it is basically nurtured. Now, they are of the opinion that nonverbal communication is learnt and the desired behavior, suppose you want to impress on somebody. So, you know that if you smile, if you say namaste, if you show some polite mannerisms, the other person is most likely to be impressed. So, they say that the desired behavior can be cultivated, you can cultivate, you can train yourself to have that desired behavior. Now, who are these people, particularly the anthropologists and then sociologists like Hall and Goffman, they think that no, it is not basically genetic, it is not that it is hereditary only, but you can also nurture, you can also cultivate certain behavior. So, they believe that using trained methods of educating oneself, we will be able to concur with this view that it is nurture. Now, this view is quite interesting for us in a professional situation because we need to go by this theory that it is not hereditary, but it is nurture. Some of the desired behavior can of course, be cultivated. There is also another thought apart from nature or nurture as propounded by some uh, communication theorists and psychologists like Mehrabian and uh, E. T. Hall. Now, their thinking is that whatever behavior you show in a communicative situation, especially the non-verbal encoding and decoding that is happening in communicative situation, they say that it is just functional and you can actually understand that from a functional perspective. So, basically they think that non-verbal communication is used to fulfill communication functions. So, if you want to show somebody that the person is respected, so then you do something to show that the person is respected. You may bow, you may say namaste or you may shake hands. If you want to show some warmth, you do certain things. If you want to show that the person is not welcome, you do not you don't show that on your face, you show a frown, you do not smile you literally give a cold shoulder, so that the person feels unwelcomed. So, you know that depending on the function, you can modify your behavior. This is also interesting just like the uh, nurture theory, that if we concur with this theory, that we can train our behavior and then we can use that behavior in a functional sense for communication purposes, we are on the right track. As far as we think that we can build a professional image in terms of nonverbal communication. This is again interesting because you can videotape your behavior in a professional situation. Let us say you participate in a group discussion and ask somebody to videotape or you participate in a mock interview and ask somebody to videotape and then you just rerun the whole thing either in the group of your friends or you sit on your own and then watch. Now, you can avoid or you can ask somebody to give feedback on the negative behavior and you can keep on avoiding all those negative behavior in the next one. When you do that, that awareness and then that thinking that you should avoid 
is actually sort of cultivating a desired behavior in you, which you are learning it because of the functional use, because of the fact that you think that you can also nurture it. Now, once again just very quickly recollecting the types of nonverbal communication, facial expression on the top and then kinesics, body movement and gesture. In fact, much has been spent these days just on body movement and gesture, so much so we equate nonverbal communication with body language. So, kinesics is sometimes gaining much more prominence compared to all other types of nonverbal communication. So, we spend more time on this and more awareness is required in terms of kinesics compared to other ones. The next one is proxemics that is the use of interpersonal space, the use of social space, the use of territory etcetera. Oculistics is with relation to eye gaze, eye contact, minimizing, maximizing it. Haptics simply refers to touch, chronomics is referring to the use of time and paralinguistics refers to the vocal cues and even the use of silence. Now, let us try to look at them briefly with some examples, so that you can understand each of these types clearly and focus on the ones that you are lacking and enhance the ones you have already some idea of. For example, chronomics. So, it is very important to know your time perception and it is also very important to know the time perception prevailing in an organization. So, if you have a different kind of time per perception and then use accordingly, you may either go late or go early and in both case it may clash with the organizational style. So, it is better to know the time perception from both sides. Now, I will get into the detail very soon. Let us start with kinesics, then I will go to face. Now, kinesics is as I said is body language. Why it is important? Why should we know about this? Watching people's actions can bring you a lot closer to the truth than barely listening to what they say. Watching people's actions can bring you a lot closer to the truth than merely listening to what they say. Remember the quote by Emerson, he also says a similar thing, he says that more than what I hear, I see what you try to tell me by what you do. Now, the same thing is suggested here, when you look at the people's actions, they tell you the actual truth and what they actually tell may sometimes be just a cover up. So, the signs of kinesthetics or body language can be very revealing. To put it in another manner, we can refer to body language as outward expressions of inner feelings. So, most of the times when verbal communication tries to focus only on the feelings which are just expressed through mind, but the actual inner feelings are the ones which are expressed through facial expressions and body language. Now, even look at some of the pictures which represent various things in terms of body language. Even when you look at some of the postures, you understand that the body often speaks more about us than words could ever do. Just by looking at a person, you know that the person is worried, you may know that the person is surprised or puzzled, you know that the person is ready, willing to discuss something, you know the person is frowning, you know the person may be in awe or maybe the person is just praying or just complaining to the Lord or wondering why the God is doing something to him again and again and so on. Just by looking at the images, you are able to form some story, some narrative. Even if you look at something like this in terms of body language, immediately you understand that okay, the person is trying to show that the person is fashionable, tattoo on the body and then jeans and then the position where it is uh, indicating. So, these things are also speaking so much. So, communication is more than just what you say, 
nonverbal communication speaks the loudest in this context. And as somebody said, your words tell me a story, but your body tells me the whole story. Words tell me a story, something it tells, but it is the body language that tells me the whole story. Now, definition of body language, it is a broad term for several forms of communication using body movements or gestures instead of or as a complement to sounds, verbal language or other forms of communication. In turn, it is one category of para language which describes all forms of human communication that are not language. Gesture is one part of body language and it varies from culture to culture, but it can be cultivated by modifying certain sociological behavior. What is gesture? Simply speaking, it is a movement of a limb or the body as an expression of thought or feeling. This is very important. Even when you move your finger, positioning something, you are expressing a thought or feeling. What is interesting about gesture is that gestures have cultural background. They are learnt within the society and culture which one belongs to. Gestures either accompany spoken language or stand alone in conveying a particular message. So, example pointing on a place on map while speaking about a site. So, the person is speaking and then there is a map and the person is pointing on the map while speaking indicating what he is talking about showing on the site. Okay. Now, he is actually using that as a kind of complement accompaniment to spoken language, but gesture can also be used sometimes without even any spoken language when you for instance point your finger at somebody asking or asking somebody to come. Now, at the same time we should also realize that some of the gestures are considered impolite. For example, if somebody is uh, of higher position and if you ask the person to come just indicating like this you are very rude impolite. Same thing goes with mood emotion which are expressed in terms of body language even tone of voice is also getting expressed in terms of body language and facial expressions. Look at various moods that I have tried to put here. So, you can you can show that you are happy, you are in overjoyed mood, you are also very sorrowful, excitement or puzzle or surprise, again some kind of uh, disturbance and then you are annoyed, so you cry. Sometimes you are just feeling sleepy, sometimes you are just trying to be aggressive, bossy and so on. Now, as far as developing a professional image of body language is concerned, there is one interesting aspect of body language which we need to focus on and that is body language in terms of voluntary and involuntary expressions or we can talk about voluntary body language or involuntary body language. Now, what is the basic difference? Voluntary body language, it refers to movement, gestures and poses intentionally made by the person such as smiling, shaking hands and imitating actions. So, when it is voluntary, the person is intentionally showing some kind of expression. So, just to make the other person feel comfortable, the person smiles, okay, greets, shakes hand or even sometimes mirrors the gesture of the other person to make the other person feel comfortable. Now, here the intention is clear, objective is known to the person, so it is voluntary. Now, in this case, there is always this realization of what is being communicated. The person knows what he is doing, nothing is happening without the person's knowledge. But this is less commonly discussed because it seems unproblematic. 
most of the times when you go and pay huge amount of money to rectify your non-verbal behavior, the non-verbal behaviorist or the person who is conducting that kind of course will be more interested in identifying your involuntary body language and then suggesting modifications on those aspect of your body language. Generally, the voluntary one is ignored because it is not at all problematic or compared to involuntary it is less problematic. It can apply to many types of soundless communication for example, formalized gestures. So, all the formalized gestures even sometimes formal hugging, formal patting. Okay. Now, all these gestures will come under voluntary body language because the person who does it knows the objective clearly and the person who receives it also knows it very clearly that the person is generating warmth or welcoming the person and so on. Now, this is not that much important because it is less problematic. Now, what is important or much more important is the involuntary body language, the involuntary dimension of body language. What is it? Involuntary movements that may give observers cues about what one is really thinking or feeling. Involuntary movements. Now, these movements are unthought of. Let us say while talking to you, I am suddenly taking my hand and then doing something with my collar button. I am playing with a pen or I am playing with my ear or doing something with my hair or no speaking, unbuttoning and rebuttoning. Now, all these things are involuntary. I do not intend to do that, but maybe I am nervous, maybe I am afraid of talking to you. So, I am expressing that in different manner, my inner feelings but I am trying to hide that by my verbal language, but it comes out involuntarily without my thinking, without my knowledge. Now, what happens? Involuntary movements that may give observers cues about what one is really thinking or feeling. You will really know when I say that this is the most interesting one and then my hand is doing something and then my eyes are just narrowing down, you understand that no, I am trying to tell a lie. Okay, maybe I myself I am not that much interested in. So, these things the audience will get across using cues from the body language, the ones particularly the involuntary ones. Now, ability to interpret such movements may itself be unconscious at least for untrained observers. Another interesting uh, fact about this is all of us interpret these uh, nonverbal cues and the ability to interpret such movements, certain negative involuntary movements happens. Okay, people do that, but then initially they may think that even they do not know what they are doing, mostly because it is happening at the unconscious level. By looking at it, they unconsciously understand certain things and they also know that they are not that trained and at least for untrained observers, generally these are found to be slightly difficult ones, although the unconscious mind will start registering the cues and they may also make the correct interpretation. So, involuntary body language is the most accurate way into a person's subconscious. Not only the inner feelings, but also the innermost mind the subconscious, the conscious mind is doing something, but the subconscious mind is annoyed with something else. Now, even that part can be easily seen by the audience by taking cues from the involuntary movement of body language. Then, who are the people who use this? Interrogators, for instance, police officers who are interrogating some terrorists or some criminals, customs examiners who want to know whether the person is hiding something or telling the truth and others, anybody who is uh, similar to this kind of profession, but who need to seek information that people do not necessarily want to give 
have always relied on explicit or implicit hypothesis about body language. All these kind of people, custom officers or police officers, interrogators, they all relied on the body language, especially the involuntary aspect of body language to see whether the person is telling the truth or hiding it, whether the person is a blatant liar or the person is really telling the truth. Now, these things are noted by taking cues from the involuntary aspect of body language. Now, this you should keep in mind because this is very important and you also give lot of involuntary body language signals to others. Now, I am not saying that you should hide your feelings all the time, but in case your feelings are negative, learn to control it and then positively change that feeling and modify the behavior very quickly. The more negative it is, the more negative the impact will be and you will not be able to get the desired response in a communication climate. So, take note of it, try to control this involuntary body language. Now, having said this, what are the basics and universals? What are the gestures? What are the movement? What kind of posture? We give certain names, how do we categorize them and how do we interpret and understand them? Now, some of the basics, for example, crossing arms and legs while standing is a defensive gesture. Now, you should also understand one slight difference in the universal that I am talking about. In the next module, we will be talking about intercultural communication, where so much focus will be given on how nonverbal behavior varies from culture to culture. Now, when I talk about some universal, some basics, these are the general universal accepted mostly in a western context or in a corporate culture, in a globalized scenario. We should also give contingency to the fact that there may be variations in our regional culture, in our nationalized scenario, which means suppose something is okay in European and American culture, it may not be that acceptable in an Indian culture. So, whenever possible, I may slightly try to tell you the difference. So, crossing arms and legs while standing is a defensive gesture. Now, even the crossing, we need to see how. So, suppose somebody is crossing like this, of course, it is a defensive one, but you must have seen uh, great leaders just standing like this. So, even uh, uh, Swami Vivekananda's famous poses like that, crossed hands but then holding it firmly. So, there it is actually exuding confidence. So, the way you are crossing the arms will also indicate how defensive you are. In case of uh, women for instance, sometimes when they do not have to do that defensive thing very openly, what they would do is they will use a folder or they will use a handbag. Now, this is also when it is used to cover up the major part of the body, it is also seen as a defensive gesture. But at the same time, if the person is just slightly crossing the hand or crossing the legs while being seated and in discussion with somebody, it may indicate that okay, you open up, I am just sympathizing with whatever you are telling, I am empathizing with you. So, you open up, I will not disturb. So, that crossed one is not indicating closeness, but it can indicate empathy, feeling into, feeling for some person. Whereas, when the persons are standing and they are crossing, it indicates closeness. It can also indicate that I do not want to mingle with you, that the person does not want to mingle with others, the person wants to remain aloof cut off from the rest, it can also mean that. Apart from that hands, what about feet? Feet also play an important part in communication, either whether you are standing or sitting 
and especially when you are attracted to someone whether or not you are talking to them this is another interesting thing which means whether you intend or not whether it is volunteered or not what happens the feet will be pointing in their direction if you are not interested the feet generally recedes they go back if you are interested partially again maybe one foot may be slightly pointing towards that person's direction so the movement the position of the feet will also indicate whether you are interested in a particular person or not in terms of attraction this again to be seen in combination with feet positioning feet movement generally it is said that if men are attracted to someone they occasionally play with one of their ear lobes okay so just to indicate that they are interested in someone in case of women there are different gestures they say that they may play with the lock of hair or continually tuck their hair behind their ears or sometimes even uh, they put the hair on the front instead of putting it on the back so this any frontal display can indicate that the person is attracted just like the feet protruding towards the person any even putting the hair on the front can indicate that the person is attracted actually now look at men while especially interacting with women if they dig the wax from their ear or if they indulge in nose picking when the uh, person is communicating or especially it happens to be women and they thoughtlessly do this this can be again an involuntary action they are doing it without their knowledge but it can indicate the filthiness of mind so the other women who actually are more perceptive in terms of non verbal communication will immediately understand that the person is either filthy or sort of perverted so one has to be careful especially in a professional situation even let us say if there is some kind of itching or something and even it is really a physical functioning of clearing that itching either from the ear or the nose one has to be very careful or it's better one apologizes excuses and goes to the restroom does it and comes back instead of doing it in front of a person particularly if the person happens to be a woman reason being it can be grossly misunderstood misinterpreted but if it is involuntary and done unintentionally it's revealing the subconscious thought of the person the person can be filthy or pervert so let's go more with this basics and universals before we actually try to learn how we can apply them how we can actually study them more on basics and universals of non verbal communication openness will be indicated by open hands or unbuttoned coat in a western scenario defensiveness will be indicated by crossed arms sideways glance that's not maintaining direct eye contact but looking at the sideways and trying to maintain a glance touching or rubbing the nose rubbing eyes buttoning the coat or buttoned coat drawing away not just getting close insecurity is also seen when somebody is trying to pinch the flesh while talking taking the pen and chewing even while listening or talking thumb over thumb biting finger nail in interaction cooperation that somebody is interested in working with somebody else and helping the person to achieve a goal now this is shown generally in the upper body in sprinter's position as if the person is about to sprint run quickly so in that position the person is showing his inclination towards helping somebody open hands again is indicating i am willing to cooperate sitting on the edge of chair 
Now, apart from cooperation, sitting on the edge of chair, later I will also tell you that it also indicates that the person is so much interested. You must be observing children, even adults, when they are watching the climax of a very interesting movie. Initially, when they sit, they were just reclined, sat very cosily and comfortably, slowly they come straight, they lean forward and then they move and then they sit on the edge of the chair, especially when the movie reaches its climax or the scene is very thrilling. So, they reach that edge. It is indicating interest, it is also indicating that somebody is willing to cooperate very closely, openly with the other person. Hand to face gestures, unbuttoning coat is again showing that I am ready, I am willing to help you. Confidence is indicated by uh, steepled hands, hands behind back, but not clasped, back stiffened not slouched, hands in coat pockets especially with thumb out, if the thumb is inside it will indicate that the person is again little bit lacking in confidence, hands on lapels of coat, so coat lapels if the hands are there again the person is indicating confidence, nervousness can be indicated by clearing throat. Now, right now I am saying this, but at the same time let us say after one more lecture, I am going to tell you certain things that you should be cautious about. Now, when I am saying clearing throat here, I am just presuming that the person is nervous and clearing the throat, but I am just cautioning you at the same time, a person may really have cold, a person may really have a congested throat and the person may <coughs> clear the throat then and there. Now, this even if the person is an expert in communication may do that because he is physically suffering from a problem, but barring this situation if a person keeps clearing throat very often and then drinks water very often before speaking it is indicating that the person is nervous. Whistling especially whistling in the dark is indicating that the person is bit afraid sometimes more afraid of some kind of imagined monsters or creepers in the dark. So, he is whistling to chase away the fear, smoking especially uncontrolled smoking behavior before an interview, before a critical situation is indicating nervousness, pinching flesh is indicating it, fidgeting, covering mouth especially uh, when the person is asked to be as straightforward as possible, the person is afraid that the person may blurt out something and the person is covering the mouth, jiggling money or keys from the pocket, making noise. So, that is again indicating nervousness, tugging ears and then even wringing hands is indicating that the person is nervous. Frustration can be shown by demonstrating certain behavior like short breaths instead of a deep one short quick breaths and then the making some sound like I am frustrated, tightly clenched hands, wringing hands, fist like gestures, rubbing hand through hair, rubbing back of the neck frequently. So, these are all some symptoms which are indicating that the person is frustrated and a quick overview tilted head, slightly tilted, it is indicating interest, stroking chin, it is indicating that the person is trying to make a decision, looking down, face turned away is indicating disbelief, biting nails is indicating insecurity, nervousness, rubbing hands is indicating anticipation. You must have seen again small children when you tell them that this week we will go to picnic to this beach or to this waterfall, immediately the kids will say oh I am ready, okay. no that rubbing hands indicating that I am excited, I am ready, I am anticipating something good to happen, 
okay. anticipation is indicated by rubbing hands, pulling or tugging at ear can indicate indecision, pulling or sometimes tugging at ear can indicate that the person is not able to arrive at some kind of conclusion, the person is not able to make a decision. Hand to cheek could mean evaluation, thinking, touching, slightly rubbing nose can indicate rejection, doubt, even lying, rubbing the eye can indicate doubt, disbelief, hands clasped behind back on the back side if the hands are clasped on the back side it can indicate anger, frustration, apprehension, locked ankles, apprehension, inspecting fingernails or looking at a watch. So, especially while talking to somebody, suddenly the person is inspecting the fingernails or looking at the watch frequently. Now, this can indicate the person is bored, getting restless, but it can also indicate vanity, pride, false pride, ego that you are wasting my time. So, condescendingly looking at the watch or looking at the fingernail and thinking that this is much more important than what you are talking. Hand resting in, head resting in hand, eyes downcast will again clearly indicate boredom. If the walk is brisk and erect, it indicates confidence and the opposite if the walk is slow and slouched shoulders drooped down, it indicates lack of confidence, even frustration. Standing with hands on hips, so hands on hips can indicate readiness, but depending on the intention mood of the person, it can also indicate aggression, show that the person is aggressive. Sitting with legs crossed, foot kicking slightly can indicate boredom, that is why one has to control the foot movement if it is kicking slightly when the person is bored, it is indicating that also. So, one has to be careful. Sitting with legs apart is open, relaxed. Remember, if it is crossed, it is indicating the person is closed and not that relaxed also, wants to be away or hide something. Arms crossed on chest, defensiveness. Walking with hands in pockets, especially completely inside the pockets and shoulders hunched. So, it can indicate dejection that the person is feeling quite rejected. At the same time, if the person is sitting with hands clasped behind head, legs crossed. So, this can indicate confidence or superiority, open palm, sincerity, openness, innocence, pinching bridge of nose, eyes closed can indicate negative evaluation, especially uh, somebody has submitted something to the boss and the boss is just pinching the nose and with the eyes closed, it can indicate that the boss is evaluating it in a negative manner, is not giving a positive consideration towards it. Tapping or drumming figures, using the fingers, if somebody is tapping or drumming so, it is indicating impatience that the person is getting restless. Steepling fingers, authority, patting, fondling, rubbing hair, lack of self confidence or insecurity. Now, just let us make a pass and look at some universals. Now, these are pictures which are available on the internet about certain things which are in French culture. Okay. And it says that this uh, one French lady indicating that if you want to indicate that someone is crazy, so one you tap your index, index finger on your forehead. So, you just tap it and indicate that the person is crazy. Now, you will also understand although it is shown that it is in French culture, you also find that this is something normal in most of the other culture, even in Indian culture. So, when you do this, you indicate that something is wrong with the brain something is wrong with this person, he is crazy, he is a nut. Now, look at the other gesture, pointing your finger at your forehead and turn it like a screwdriver. So, if you use it and turn it like a screwdriver, so you also indicate literally that the nut has gone loose, is loose, gone crazy. Now, this is again a universal kind of gesture, okay. this is again 
apart from culture this is also commonly felt in other cultures. Now, coming to the face so much so about general body language use of gestures to indicate certain things. Let us look at the face as I told you before face is the most powerful channel of nonverbal communication. Why face is the most powerful one? Because even if you miss sometimes looking at the movement of the feet, looking at legs, looking at the position of the body, you always note the face. Then also face has eyes. So, you understand so much by eye contact, you understand so much by the open eyes, narrowed eyes, you also have nose and you see what the hand does to the nose. You also have ears and what the hand does to the ears can indicate something negative also. You also see the mouth and how smile is coming, how the tone is coming out, what way certain things are being expressed, you all observe all these things. So, what we actually do when we use face for communication we actually indulge in a kind of encoding decoding process. What we do is we encode some of our thoughts feelings on certain facial expressions and we generate those expressions and communicate those thoughts. Okay, I am happy, I smile, I am annoyed, I am angry, I frown. Okay, and so on. Now, we also decode when we are encoding and sending it simultaneously we are also decoding the expressions of the other person and also we are trying to decode the innermost thoughts of the other person and we are simultaneously involved in this encoding decoding process using face particularly. So, that is why looking at the face itself we modify our own uh, action. Even in the most simple interaction what we do is we focus on face, we look at the person's face and decide determine the next course of action. If the person is showing boredom we realize that either we should change our communication strategy or we should stop the communication act itself. So, face gives clues to clues to what kind of innermost feelings for instance attraction whether somebody is attracted to somebody else now the person looks at the face of the other person so frequently the eyes are fixed the eyes are wide open the person is not able to control looking at the other person so attraction the face is just inclined towards the other person interest in relationship it also indicates whether the person is interested in communicating talking to somebody or not interest. When the person is interested what happens is the face is cheerful, the eyes are wide open and the eye contact and the face to face interaction is maintained. When the person is showing disinterest the person will not show the face directly, the person will move away or maintain a side glance, will not maintain direct glance. So, interest disinterest and then display of emotions, I am going to talk about some universal emotions, but let us look at some of the emotions like I am happy, I am unhappy, I am irritated, I am annoyed, I am getting angry, okay, I am warning you, I am afraid. Now, we express all these things just through the face identity, I am a professor, I am a doctor, I am sophisticated, I am not cultured, I am a freak, I am a saint and so on. And at the same time not just identity, the background, I am from this region, I am from this country. Looking at one's hair, looking at one's hair style, looking at the way a person is speaking, you are able to identify the region. 
the moment the person uses some facial expression and adds a verbal component to it, you get everything about the person, identity, background, etcetera, age of the person. Even if the person is talking on phone, sometimes you can assess the age and face just by even without listening to the verbal thing, looking at the wrinkles. So, you are able to measure the age of the person. Then humor, whether the person is cheerful or distressed, you are able to understand that, what kind of constitution the person has got in his mind. And some of the subtexts, the person says something verbally, but means something else. The person says that he might be interested in this, but the eyes are narrowed down. So, you understand that the person is not that much interested or bit suspicious. So, the subtext that actually determines the meaning of what is being communicated. So, that is also expressed through face. So, watching face could be a pastime, could be a professionally challenging task in which we encode our own expressions, feelings embedded in it and we also decode what the other person is telling. I will conclude this part of the lecture with this note on face, facial expressions. We will continue more with space, territory, touch and all that in the coming lecture. So, till then just revise whatever I have told in the previous lecture and then continue with this one. In this one particularly we have focused more on body language and I would suggest that now you start looking at the whole environment, looking at the people around in terms of nonverbal behavior. Sometimes just switch off or put your TV on mute and just look at the behavior and see whether you are able to get the story looking at the behavior. This is an interesting task until we go to the next lecture, you can just do something and benefit on your own from this. Till we meet in the next one, I say thank you and bye, thank you so much. Thank you.